crowd squaring. We shout for our team. You shout for yours. Yeah. No. Yes, back to Germany, my friend. Hello and welcome to a tactical history of Liverpool. Liverpool may have sealed their second league title under Bill Shankly with a match to spare, but their season wasn't over yet. Their first ever FA Cup win was a success in itself, but it also opened up a way back into European football for the Reds. After making it to the semi-finals of the European Cup the season prior, Liverpool would now get a shot at the European Cup Winners' Cup. It was no easy task though. Liverpool had an incredibly tough run through what was generally considered to be the weakest of the three continental competitions. They started their campaign with a trip to Turin to face Italian giants Juventus. Shankly had learned a lesson from Liverpool's first venture into Europe. Now away from home, they would look to contain the opposition, leaving the attacking for Anfield. Juventus manager Heriberto Herrera was in the process of adopting his namesake Helenio's into tactics though. Playing their own brand of Catenaccio, neither Juventus nor Liverpool did much, cancelling each other out. A late long-distance stroke from Gianfranco Leoncini gave Juve the lead in a match that otherwise, in the words of Tommy Smith, passed without incident. Less than 20 minutes into the return lag at Anfield, a header from Chris Lawler at a free kick saw Liverpool equalise on aggregate, then only five minutes later, they took the lead. Juventus gave the ball away cheaply in their own half, allowing Liverpool to break straight at them, and while they repelled the initial attack, they could only scramble the ball as far as Jeff Strong on the edge of the box to finish. That was enough for Liverpool to progress to face Standard Liège. Standard were a strong side throughout the 60s and early 70s, winning six league titles and two Belgian Cups despite having to compete with rivals and elect. With Lawler opening the scoring just two minutes into the first leg, Liverpool were able to run up a 3-1 lead to take to Belgium. Standard would pull a goal back, but a powerful run from Ian St. John saw him square the ball to Roger Hunt to equalise on the night. St. John beating the lad into Hunt and it's a goal! Then some neat feet from Ian Callaghan saw him beat two players and cross to St. John to head home, seeing Liverpool through with a 5-2 aggregate victory. In the quarter-finals, Liverpool were drawn against Honved. A decade prior, the Budapest side were at their peak, the players forming the base of the Hungarian Mighty Magyar side that won Olympic gold and made it to the final of the 1954 World Cup. The failure of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 spelled the end for that side though. Honved were out of the country at the time, playing Athletic Bilbao in the European Cup. And with the Soviet Union stepping in to repress the uprising, many of the players refused to return home. The likes of Ferenc Puskas, Sander Koksis and Zoltan Zibor all fled, gutting the side. They only managed to avoid relegation the following season thanks to the Hungarian Federation deciding to expand the first division. And although they managed to improve enough to finish as runners-up a few times, Honved wouldn't truly recover and win the league again until the 80s. Liverpool would only manage a goalless draw away to Honved, yet took up the opportunity to sample Budapest's nightlife. I somehow or rather end up on this stage with the, the dancing girls uh, doing the twist. Little did I know that I was being filmed by Granada TV. We had a good time, went home. It was on the night after we'd come back from uh, playing Honved. I'm sitting in the city with my wife, and uh, she's saying, you know, like a place, was it wrong? I said, oh, bloody awful place. I said, nothing to do, you know. I said, we had a couple of drinks afterwards, and that's all fair enough. And uh, whenever I'd said this, you know, the nightclub appeared on the television, and, and I thought to myself, a nightclub? I said, I can't believe this, I'm gonna be on this. And there I was, you know, and uh, you probably got the footage of me doing the twist with these girls, you know. And 
I couldn't believe it. I looked over and, and the wife looked at me and she went, I thought you said there was nothing to do. Back at Anfield, Lawler once again opened the scoring for Liverpool, as he had in every round so far, and St John added a second to take the Reds through to face Celtic in the semi-finals. Chuck Steen would go on to become Celtic's greatest ever manager, yet he was merely in the process of building up the Glaswegians at this point. He had taken over late the previous season, in March 1965, leading them to Scottish Cup victory with a win over Dunfermline in Athletic, sealing them a place in Europe despite finishing 8th in the league. Just as Liverpool were on their way to winning the league, Celtic were on their way to winning theirs in Steen's first full season in charge, setting this tie up as a meeting between the two best sides in Britain. Celtic were a bloody good side, recalled Ron Yates, but Shanks had done his homework and we sat back instead of our usual cavalier approach. It was enough to limit Celtic to just one goal at Parkhead, before once again opening up at Anfield. Tommy Smith equalised from a free kick midway through the second half, and six minutes later, Jeff Strong, filling in for the injured Roger Hunt and himself carrying cartilage injury, nodded down a Callaghan cross to take Liverpool through to the first ever European final. They were to face Borussia Dortmund at Hampden Park. BBC One, it's 7.25. <laughs> Dortmund had beaten the likes of Atletico Madrid and Holders West Ham to make it to the final, and were leading the Bundesliga coming into the game, although they would lose their three remaining matches to end up in second behind 1860 Munich. They were set up in a 4-3-3 shape, albeit a lopsided one. On the right, Reinhard Labuda would come deeper, helping out defensively much as Ian Callahan did, yet also giving himself more space to get on the ball and dribble forward. For his Lothar Emmerich would remain forward on the left, often tucking inside into the centre as Seyfried Hell dropped off. With Roger Hunt deemed fit enough to return after missing the semi, and Jeff Strong ruled out for injury, Liverpool would once again continue with the same lineup we saw in the last episode, setting up in a 4 2 4 formation. In truth, it was a pretty miserable game. Although the pitch held up comparatively well, the weather was awful, with torrential rain near flooding Hamden. The stadium could hold over 100,000 spectators, but less than half that braved the storm to attend the match. Liverpool had more control over the match, but they failed to convert that into meaningful chances. This was partly due to the way Dortmund defended. They used a man-marking scheme, with spare man Wolfgang Paul acting as a sweeper. Wilhelm Sturm on Roger Hunt, Rudi Sauer on Ian St. John, Gerhard Celiacs on Peter Thompson, and Theodore Redder on Ian Callahan. Regardless of where Liverpool's attackers went, Dortmund's defenders stuck to them. This meant that as soon as a Liverpool attacker received the ball, they had a defender immediately on top of them, giving them no time or space to do anything with it. If somehow a Liverpool attacker managed to escape their marker, then Paul was on hand to step across and cover. Liverpool would try to work their way around this by having the attacker switch positions. Hunt would drift off to other flanks, while midway through the half, Thompson and Callahan began to switch wings. Dortmund's defenders were happy to simply follow them away from their nominal positions though, meaning Liverpool's attackers still struggled to get any space. If Liverpool were to get anywhere, it was probably going to have to come from one of the deeper players, who weren't being marked as tightly. Throughout the match, Gordon Milne was pushing forward into attack, either making runs through the centre or popping off on the right. Like the attackers, he was generally able to find some space to receive a ball, however he still wasn't able to make the difference for Liverpool. Firstly, these situations were exactly why Paul was playing as a spare man. The sweeper could come across to defend against Milne, without any of the other defenders having to leave their men. Secondly, while Milne might get a bit of space in the final third, all his teammates around him were still closely marked. This meant he could get on the ball in good positions, but had no one to actually pass it to. Thirdly, Although Milne did often manage to make an untracked run, Dortmund's midfielders, particularly Dieter Kurat, were generally diligent defensively. They mostly remained deep, willing to drop into or close to the back line to plug any gaps, leaving little space to attack. If Liverpool were to break Dortmund down, they probably needed to commit even more players forward. Right from the off, Tommy Smith would push up into midfield, but he only really moved up into attack a handful of times. Willie Stevenson generally remained deeper, likely looking to provide balance to the midfield with Milne pushing forward. Likewise, with Smith pushing up into midfield, it was rare for Chris Lawler and Jerry Byrne to push forward. Dortmund were making the game difficult for Liverpool, but they weren't exactly providing much of a threat themselves. Their style was better suited to the bad weather, as they generally hit aerial balls direct towards the attackers, meaning they weren't getting bogged down on a sticky pitch, yet these were still basically just long punts forward. They did threaten with some passes in behind Liverpool's back line, asking Tommy Lawrence to rush out and sweep. Their main success was from the great first touch of Emmerich, though. 
Forward was frequently able to lay off to his teammates what were little more than hopeful punts forward, enabling Dortmund to actually get the ball under control in Liverpool's half. This allowed them to bring the talents of Held into play, while Alfred Schmidt also managed to ghost unnoticed into attacking areas a few times. Although Emmerich was sometimes able to turn these long passes into something significant, just as often these long balls went nowhere, to nobody though, handing possession back over to Liverpool. Dortmund's only other way of progressing the ball seemed to be making use of the dribbling of Labuda. The winger would often come deep into his own half, getting space away from Byrne to receive a ball, then carrying it forward himself. With both teams cancelling each other out, the first half unsurprisingly finished goalless. The match seemed to be continuing in much the same way in the second half, until Dortmund finally opened the scoring just after the hour mark, catching Liverpool on the counter-attack. Smith pushing up into midfield boosted Liverpool going forward, but also had the obvious drawback of weakening the back line. Dortmund had already took advantage of this a few times, breaking forward at Liverpool's defence while Smith was caught upfield. The goal also showcased another pattern of play though, with Emmerich willing to come into the centre and lead the line, held it often being able to drop off, drawing Ron Yates forward to leave a gap in the back line. The goal saw Dortmund win the ball back off Milne and play a quick ball forward to Held, drawing Yates forward. Held laid the ball off to Emmerich, and with Smith stationed in midfield and Yates drawn forward, there was a massive gap through the middle. Emmerich knocked a pass over the top for Held attacking the gap, who struck a beautiful volley over Lawrence. Byrne was quickly across the cover, but Held got a shot away so quickly it didn't matter. It took just seven minutes for Liverpool to equalise though. Dortmund's defensive strategy worked so long as the markers could keep their man quiet, but in the case of Celiacs that was getting tricky. He was able to keep Thompson under wraps early on, but as the game wore on the winger was starting to get the upper hand. His dribbling made it difficult to judge which way he was going. Thompson would shape one way, pointing his hips as if to come inside for example. Celiacs would adjust his feet to combat that threat, then Thompson would go down the outside anyway. With Thompson able to go both inside and outside, Celiacs didn't really know how to set himself and Thompson kept wriggling away. The goal saw Smith poke a pass to Thompson on the right, who took a touch and drew in Celiacs before pushing the ball past him. He then beat Redder too, and Stern with another swivel of his hips, shaping to cut inside then knocking it to the byline. Dortmund defenders claim the ball went out of play, however Thompson cut the ball back into the box for Hunt, left free thanks to Stern being forced across the cover to finish. Dortmund's man marking kept a close eye on Liverpool's attackers, but Thompson's dribbling saw him take three players out of the game. With a stalemate finally broken, Liverpool were finally committing more men forward to break down Dortmund's defence. The likes of Stevenson, Lawler and Byrne were now liberated to join the attack when the situation called for it. It was coming a little late though. Both sides were clearly exhausted well before the 90 minutes were up, and so they didn't really have the energy to push for another goal. Dortmund had even publicly admitted before the match that they were suffering from fatigue. I read in a French football magazine that Borussia Dortmund was saying they were tired after a hard season. Having played 10 more league games from Dortmund and done it using just 14 players, Liverpool weren't any better off. We spoke about the benefits of this approach in the last episode, but here was its downside. Come the end of the season, Liverpool's best players all had a lot of miles wearing on their heavy legs and simply didn't have the energy to push any further. It was most obvious with Hunt. The striker had been declared fit to play after an ankle injury, but he clearly wasn't, looking well off the pace and hobbling by the end of the game. The match was pretty much over as a spectacle even before extra time, and the players weren't about to get any second wind. Dortmund were to get a second goal though. Smith once again pushed forward into midfield, and when none of the knackered Dortmund players closed him down, upped his pace and pushed forward. A good idea, but not one his heavy legs could support giving away a free kick by lunging into a challenge when he reached a dead end. Dortmund played a quick free kick, and Schmidt, with Smith still upfield, launched a quick pass in behind for Held to chase. Lawrence rushed out and got to it first, but the loose ball fell to Labuda to shoot first time with the goalkeeper in no man's land. Labuda's shot cannoned off the post though, only to rebound off of Yates, who had rushed back to cover for Lawrence, and cross the line. Needing a goal, Liverpool pushed everyone forward and launched the ball long into the box. Usually it would probably pay better to be more patient and try to carve out a higher quality chance, but Liverpool simply didn't have the legs for it anymore. A lucky bounce in the box was a much more likely goal scoring opportunity. To their credit, Dortmund continued to play sportingly, but even they ended up resorting to time wasting at the death, with both sides clearly wanting to be put out of their misery. Dortmund held out to win the Cup Winners' Cup for the only time in their history. Shankly was a notoriously bad loser, and wanting to keep his players morale high, would always come up with some reason for why the opposition didn't deserve to win when Liverpool were beaten. He called Dortmund a team of frightened men, 
and labelled their goals as flukes, calling them the worst team we met in the competition this season. However, he would later admit that we didn't play well when we gave away two silly goals. The players were all much more willing to accept responsibility for the result. On the night, we weren't that good. I mean, we got beat 2-1 after extra time. The second goal, uh, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still a folk hero in uh, Borussia because of it, because it was an OG from me. This lad chipped it. I, I had first seen he was going to chip it, and I, I thought it was going to hit the bar and go over. Instead, it hit the crossbar, came down, hit me in the chest, and went in the net, and that was the winning goal. In their second season in European competition, Liverpool had made it even further than their first, yet they fell at the final hurdle. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook, links are in the description, but most importantly by supporting Holding Me Field on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching.